Thank you everybody for joining us today. I am very honored to be hosting this amazing group of people on this very important panel. COVID-19 has definitely changed all of our lives. Um, what was sort of unexpected for me, the discrimination and racism that came along with it. And I was feeling very helpless. And so I started to talk to my friends um, about what to do, what can we do? And, um, and I would like to share some of the conversations that I had with many people. And since we're on a very limited time schedule, let's just get right to it. Um, I'm not gonna introduce, I mean, I'm not going to spend my time introducing everybody because I think everybody's reputations kind of precede them. And, uh, but we're gonna start with Phil Chan who recently published his book, uh, Final Bow for Yellowface. I was wondering, Phil, can you please tell us a little bit about your book and also what you have done to combat this um, climate, this unfortunate climate that we're all in? Sure. Um, so my name is Phil. I'm the co-founder of a conversation called Final Bow for Yellowface. Um, essentially, uh, I was invited by Peter Martins, who is the artistic director of New York City Ballet, to advise him on how to update George Balanchine's iconic Nutcracker. Um, he was sort of in a bind because uh, he couldn't change the choreography because this was something that was passed down from George Balanchine, but um, he also was getting more and more letters every year from audience members really uh, uncomfortable with how Chinese people were being presented in terms of um, sort of a very caricatured portrayal um, and also you know, the use of yellow face. Um, so we talked about three aspects of the dance, the makeup, the choreography, and the costuming. Um, and Peter Martins made a couple of small changes to the Nutcracker. And so following that conversation, I called my good friend, Georgina Paskogan, who's a soloist at New York City Ballet, who's also Asian American. And we thought, well, if Peter Martins, who's this, has this responsibility to uphold this conservative tradition, um, if he was willing to change, then why not every ballet company in the country? And so what would it take to start a larger conversation about addressing um, the sort of you know, outdated Asian representations in our little corner of the world. So um, we bought yellowface.org for $10. Uh, we put up a pledge that says, um, essentially, I love ballet and I'm committed to improving how Asians are represented on our stages. And over the last two years, we've gotten pretty much every major American ballet company to sign the pledge. Um, as well as a lot of the leading international companies. So I wrote this book um, about the many conversations that I had had with different dance companies around how they were representing Asian people. Um, we looked at both the history of Asian representation in the United States, but also the history of these dance works themselves. So um, my book is a little bit of Asian American history, a little bit of dance history, a little bit of my own experience with this conversation. Um, but it's a way for people who maybe are uncomfortable around conversations about uh, cultural appropriation, um, it, you know, inequality, privilege, um, to have a, a way to talk about these things by using dance um, as an example. So using the arts as a way to talk about it. Um, I was supposed to release the book uh, in June, um, but because of the coronavirus and the quarantine, I felt like I need to get it out sooner. So I released the ebook um, in March and the proceeds of which um, of that of my book launch was a virtual book party went to the Museum of Chinese in America. They just suffered a huge fire earlier this year. So if any of you guys are interested in supporting another great organization, um, the Museum of Chinese in America really needs your help in preserving um, their archives. So we raised some money for them. Um, but um, yeah, essentially my book is, is a best practice for how to deal with outdated representations of race in the performing arts and um, also a, sort of a, a way for people to help think about how we're dealing with race um, here in America. So that's, that's my project. Can you talk a little bit about um, your method, uh, how you were, um, yeah. Yeah, so um, the subtitle of my book is called Dancing Between Intention and Impact. So often when you're trying to address something that um, doesn't feel right or is, is racist or um, is inequitable, um, the tendency is to, to call out and say, well, that's wrong, that's racist, you're racist. 
And what that does is shut people down and make them defensive, and then they're not able to hear um, you know, what you have to say, um, even if it's constructive, because they're just so defensive. Whereas if you can phrase it in a way that says, hey, I know that your intention was to do this, but the impact landed actually over here. Was that what you meant to, to say, or is that how you meant it to come across? And if you're an artist, and you you care about your work. You really do want to make sure that what you're trying to say and what how it's received by the audience is congruent. And so when an artist realizes that what they're saying isn't how the audience is receiving it, they'll want to retool, you know, what they're saying or what they're what they're portraying. So and in that space, we're able to have a constructive conversation around race and um, around what actually we're looking at without people feeling um, you know, as defensive as they can be, because these are hard conversations, and um, especially when we're dealing with communities with, which are majority white, where they might not necessarily have had to have those hard conversations or have the depth of these conversations in this way, um, it can be pretty challenging. So um, that's one strategy that that has helped me um, kind of dismantle some of the defensiveness when I'm addressing problematic situations and dynamics. Can you just elaborate a little bit on the, um, the what happened at the New York City Ballet? Yeah, so the original Nutcracker, um, uh, it, he has a sort of a Fu Manchu mustache and a rice patty hat, and they're, they're sort of dancing with these bobbly heads and little fingers, and uh, the makeup, their eyes are sort of painted up to their ears, and the women wear these sort of really big, sort of ornate Japanese, headdresses with black hair um, and it's sort of the head bobbing has sort of been turned down over the years um, and so it's even the dance itself has changed but um, originally it was done in um, sometimes yellow then white face um, makeup uh, and then what, what I talked to Peter Martins about was the three areas that needed changing so the makeup um, I said, you know, you, you already have some handsome Asian guys in the company. Like, why do they need to, to put on the extra makeup for us to see that they're Chinese? Um, and so even talking about things like class. So instead of having a low class representation of a worker, a poor worker, a railroad worker, which is historically accurate, but mo maybe not the most flattering, why couldn't it be a royal Chinese crown, like, so that every other nationality represented also gets a royal representation? Um, and then looking at the choreography, you know, the shuffling, the bobbing, it's just, it's so tired. Like, what else could it be? Um, and so kind of closing that section, um, I talk about this in the book, um, another company that does this same choreography, uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet, the artistic director, Peter Bowl, called me and said, hey, I have this idea. I don't know if this work, promise you won't laugh. And uh, he said, what if instead of, you know, these two girls, they wheel out the box and what's in the box? And usually it's this sort of Chinese Cooly character, but what if instead of that it was a Chinese cricket? I said, Peter, that's so brilliant. It's um, the most musical Chinese uh, creature, um, just like Balanchine dancers are the most musical. Uh, it's um, it's a lot of big jumps, just like a cricket, and it's um, sort of like it. It comes from Chinese culture, like people would keep crickets in a box, and so you'd open your box and this cricket would jump out, and so it's. It's appropriating something positive from our culture as opposed to saying, oh, well, Chinese people had the Q and the Fu Manchu and the, you know, and the, they, they, they just, it, it's sort of like a, an ugly bygone trope. Like, why are we still performing that instead of something celebratory? So that solution enables them to keep the choreography intact because, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in preserving dance history as well. That's part of my heritage as a dancer. So you're able to keep the choreography, but have it just be more respectful. So like, if having a choice, why not have that? So I had a recent dance magazine uh, in Germany ask me, well, it's just a costume, right? It's not a big deal. And I said, okay, well, what if you think about in 1944, when America's first Nutcracker happened, what if there was a German dance? And what if we decided that what Germans looked like in 1944 was appropriate in this ballet and we just kept performing this ballet every year and now in 2020 do you really think having goose stepping Nazis in a Nutcracker ballet is appropriate and the reporter was like oh yeah okay I, I get that you know so um, it's beyond that and, and what the bigger picture as it relates to COVID is 
is when people see Chinese Americans as these two-dimensional flat caricatures, they don't see us as real people. They can spit on us. They can. They don't. They don't see that um, we're their neighbors. We're their friends. We're their colleagues. We are in this community. We're contributing as well. We're also Asian Americans, so we are also as American as they are. But because they might not have had images, whether in film, whether in media, whether on the ballet stage of nuanced portrayals, it's very easy to demonize people. So that's really at the heart of our work. So yes, it is the Nutcracker. Yes, it's just figuring out costuming. But at the heart of the issue is about representing Asian people with nuance so that this doesn't happen. I mean, the bigger picture is we could go to war with China at any time. And we know what, we, we look at the Japanese Americans, we've seen what that history looks like. And we see the images of how Japanese Americans have been demonized um, and what that was able to ultimately justify that us doing to them. And I don't want that to repeat itself again. So if I can fight for nuance, then we can all be better and, and um, be less likely to respond negatively when we encounter xenophobia and racism. So. Thank you, Phil. Um, so I'm going to move on to Deja. Hi, Deja. Hi. Deja and I have known each other for a very long time, and we've worked on many, many projects together. And um, I wanted to ask you, you are the head of, um, what is, I don't know your exact title, but I know you are a very important person at Young Arts. You're like a director or something, right? And, um, and a Young Arts is an organization that works with um, um, high school kids, is it? Maybe I'll let you talk about Young Arts, uh, but I, I'm interested in knowing, because you are you know, daily dealing with young people, how are you addressing this issue? Um, or how is your organization addressing this issue? Well, firstly, thank you, Inez, for, um, for asking me to join this panel. It's really great to see so many new friends and old friends. And um, Young Arts is uh, a mission-driven organization that identifies the most accomplished young artists but supports them throughout their entire careers. So while the age of entry may be 15 to 18 years old, we support an artist at every critical juncture. And we know that could be at the emerging, the established stage, and everything in between. So we work with like a lot of young teenagers, but we also work with um, artists who are just coming out of school or who may have opted not to go to post-secondary school or who may be in a second or third stage um, of their careers. So, I mean, one thing that I think is um, that I have to get off my chest this week has been a really hard week, right? Like, you know, um, every week is a hard week. I think um, we're here because there's a history of institutional racism. There's a medical term for it called weathering. And this has been a particularly weathering week. And so while I want to share my thoughts from the young arts perspective, it's very hard to separate your heart and who you are, right, in a moment like this. And I think these moments call for people to compartmentalize themselves. This is what I do. This is what I represent in my job. This is who I am in the public space. Oh, I'm in front of a white audience. Let me position it this way. Let me use the language so people receive me this way. Let me change who I am. And, you know, I think Phil is talking about a perception problem, which is real. The way that we're portrayed in the media and in propaganda advances a certain narrative. But I really think um, the crux of the problem is supremacy, white supremacy. And I don't give a shit how you position any of this. When there is racism and when there is hatred, that, that's the problem. Media and um, propaganda serve as tools to reinforce certain ideas. But ultimately, it is the supremacist system and not believing, to Phil's point, that people are human, that all people are human. That makes it that one person can put their knee on another man's neck in the middle of the street with no fear of retribution. So 
you know, I think that um, working in an arts organization, sometimes, you know, you're a little bit in a bubble, right? Because we know how algorithms work, right? There's a lot of reinforcing of our own ideas. And I think one of the reasons why this series that you've put together is so important, and one of the things that arts institutions can do is to serve as mechanisms for cross-pollination. And that's something that I think young people already know how to do. You know, they're already thinking about collaboration. They're already thinking about the together economy. When you think about um, who filmed that video of George Floyd, that was a young student at a college who had the presence of mind to know that something was going down and she better take out her camera. Because had we not had that footage, who's to know what would have happened, right? So I think young people are very attuned to what's happening in the world. They consume a lot of information and they're brought up in this age of information. And whenever somebody tells me, oh, what are we gonna do with millennials or rolls their eyes against millennials, I think you know, these are the people who have the power to break the mold. Because whatever we've been doing and whatever older generations have been doing hasn't necessarily been working. Um, a couple of months ago, I was in a conversation where one question was asked, do we need a revolution or an evolution? You know, and while I understand the desire to work within a system, to break it and to make it more expansive and to change minds, you know, a whole other part of me is like, just burn the whole thing down and let's start, let's start anew, right? And I think that's really the power of artists. I mean, before there was a, a person walking on the moon, there was probably a crazy sci-fi writer at their desk in a corner penning this idea of like a whole new exploration in space. Like, can we please, like, can we please create a whole new exploratory path, one that's not based on the dominion of one people over another. And so, you know, I think as an organization, what we really pride ourselves in doing is offering mentorship um, with notable artists, um, people like Mel Chin, who will come into um, one of our classrooms or to come to one of our programs and just share real life advice, you know, and share their perspective. And then also put them in a room with someone like Derek Adams and put them in the room, right, um, with another artist, right? And artists not only from the visual arts, um, but from music. Um, and also think about voice, think about how um, Jonah Baker is addressing um, social issues in his dance. Think about how Christy Edmonds from CAP UCLA is programming. So just bringing in all of these different voices from different artistic disciplines, knowing that it's not one art form or one genre or one people who's gonna solve this, but if we're really looking to address anything, right, that we all need to be talking to each other and working much more collaboratively, not cooperatively. You know, sometimes we think about um, having important conversations. We actually have to be brave. Like somebody has to perhaps get mad, right? And not get their way. And we then have to be okay with that, right? Because I think it's important that um, we don't acquiesce always, right? To the lowest common denominator, but we push ourselves to go beyond and to go further. And that's really the kind of nurturing that as an organization we try and do with artists is expose them to as many different things as possible and give them as many tools as possible, whether it's creative development, professional development, introductions, relationships, networks, so they can really take their art form to the next level. And I think, you know, when we talk about our vision, which is to um, empower artists to pursue a life in the arts, we really focus on the artists because if we do our job right, if we're able to give the artists a platform and the tools to raise a voice that they already have within them and to be more empathetic as possible, then they will have an exponential impact on our world. So, so that's who we're investing in. We're investing in the most brilliant minds, the change makers, the leaders of tomorrow with the idea that their light is gonna give back over and over again. And so we're hoping to make allies, maybe even accomplices, out of these artists. Thank you, Deja. 
Um, so we're going to move on to Karen Tam and I just want to tell all the attendees there will be a question and answer session after this. So please just hang on to your questions until the end and we'll be happy to get try to get through all of them. Um, so Karen, your work is all about history. Karen, um, would you want to talk a little bit about what you've done in this um, post COVID era to help combat racism? Sure. Um, well, I'd say like most of my work, I, I, I'm considering myself an installation artist who I guess like many other artists work in different sort of like sculpture, drawings, video, writing and stuff. Um, and uh, it revolves around the dismantling of colonial notions and attitudes of Chinese culture. Um, and the work also aims to highlight sort of the invisibility of Chinese Canadian life and history. Um, and one way that I've done um, this is through extensive um, archival research um, and work with um, community. Um, and by, I believe, creating a visual archive of um, Chineseness um, through, for example, my installations, they would act in a way like a counter archive, um, counter history to the more official ones. Um, so some of the installations I've done, installation projects, I restage, reframe the spatial cultural forms of Chinese uh, Canadian or Chinese American um, restaurants, Chinatown curio shops, um, historical, uh, I'm, I'm very like Chinese Canadian focused at the moment. So Chinese Canadian historical photo studios, artist studios, opium dens, and other cultural sites. Um, and I guess in a way I was thinking how I experience art myself um, is that I seem to kind of, um, when it's like immersive interactive types of um, environments, for me, I seem to kind of remember it more. There's, there's this sort of corporeal experience that um, I wanted to also um, bring out in my own work. Um, and so in producing this specific Chinese uh, spatiality, um, I'm hoping to confront, um, to confront the perpetuating myths and stereotypes to engage and problematize history, memory, and their representations. So I'll just like some examples are um, one of my first series of installations called Gold Mountain Restaurant, where I recreated the interiors of Chinese Canadian restaurants inside gallery and museum spaces from like 1930s to 1980s type of thing um, to highlight the experiences and stories of restaurateurs and their families. Um, and also I worked with, well, I worked with my parents a lot. Um, and my projects, but with this one specifically, um, you know, I, I interviewed um, current and retired restaurateurs about their experiences, and I put that inside inside the the exhibitions. Um, I also borrowed you know, lots of um, furniture and and anything that they had in their collection, um, and in a way, it's bringing. Um, a community that hasn't necessarily been, um, who, who don't necessarily see themselves in you know, institutions like uh, art museums, um, galleries and such. Um, another installation that um, I'm touring at the moment is called With Wings Like Clouds Hung, Hung From The Sky. I wanted to look at a little known artist called Li Nam, who worked in 1930s Victoria Chinatown and we only know about him through the journals of Emily Carr, who's um, you know, one of Canada's icons, modernist painter. And so I wanted to reimagine his studio to create this, this installation that, that has kind of like gotten bigger and bigger each time I've shown this. Um, and to also invite um, local practitioners of inkbrush paintings to have their work in the show alongside um, historical paintings by Emily Carr, as well as um, Chinese uh, inkbrush masters like uh, Tai Bak Se, Tan Su, uh, Tan Su Yan, um, and such. So you know, in a way questioning and asking who gets to be included in Canadian art history? Who gets to be included in Chinese art history? Um, and wondering about who the fir first, say, Chinese Canadian artists were. Um, so 
those are two two projects that I've I've um, worked on for a number of years. Um, I guess in other ways um, where you know thinking about how I can support my community, uh, support um, younger artists. Um, is through mentorship programs. I'm involved with two um, in Montreal. One is uh, Les Territoires, which is an artist-run center. And um, we're about to go into our third edition. And so it's having, so I was involved first as a mentor and then now as the board member, um, where we follow six uh, emerging artists over a period of six months. Um, and you know, to help, um, so, uh, them develop um, and to balance work, art, family, life. Um, the, uh, the second one that I'm involved in was is called uh, Diversité Artistique Montréal, um, which pairs a, a, a Montreal um, established artist with um, an artist who is either a newcomer, new arrival um, from the culturally diverse community or indigenous artist. And so in a way, this would help solidify and um, help them integrate um, into the arts milieu um, in Montreal or in Canada. And since the start of the pandemic, I think like a lot of other people, like a lot of other arts artists, um, you know, dealing with um, sort of uh, uh, engagements, uh, exhibitions, and projects that have been postponed um, or, or canceled. So kind of thinking about other ways, new ways of working um, and making art in this moment where, um, you know, we see this huge spike in anti-Asian, anti-Chinese um, 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 attacks and harassment. Um, so some of the ways I'm thinking of, of supporting or that I'm, I am um, hoping to support um, other artists is by creating opportunities where other more artists can take it, um, can can benefit. Um, two of these are, are two curatorial projects that I'm working on. Um, one in the fall called uh, Rencontre avec l'autre soi-même, um, vaguely translated as um, encountering the other yourself. Um, and so I'm working with uh, a mid three artists, a mid career artist, Julie Vaquin, and then two emerging artists um, who were uh, former participants of our mentorship program with Les Territoires. Because I was thinking, like, a longer term sort of mentorship, whether it be, um, you know, uh, uh, like officially or, or just, um, just thinking about how they could benefit more. Um, and then during collaborations with um, my friend Gordon Chung, um, so we're working on a, a series of limited prints um, that highlight um, the, the stories of individuals who have contributed to Chinese Canadian American, the Chinese diaspora history. Um, and that proceeds of this would go to, um, for, to, to the ICFAC. Um, to support the overseas uh, Chinese uh, creative community. Um, so those are just some of the things that I've been doing. And then, um, you know, I'd love to hear what everyone else um, has suggestions in terms of how else that we can support our, our creative community or our community in general. So, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so we're moving on to Dee. Hi, Dee. You're muted. Oh. Okay. Um, so D, um, this this conversation actually started with you. <laughs> I I I didn't realize when all this racism and all of this discrimination was coming about. I started to see a lot of articles between Asians and Blacks and how they were kind of pitched against each other and. Um, so I called up my friend D and I said, D, what's going on? I've never seen anything like this before. He goes, oh, girl, this has been going on forever. So can you tell everybody a little bit about what we talked about? Yeah, I'm a veteran. So uh, thanks, Inez, for organizing this really amazing panel addressing the impact of COVID-19 racism. And so this conversation really comes at a particularly gruesome moment in American history. So 
this morning, the death toll from the virus is north of 100,000 Americans. And with that, the backdrop to this, this week is the killing in broad daylight of George uh, Floyd, police violence. Also, a white woman uh, exercising privilege, white privilege, calling the cops on a law-abiding African-American citizen. Now, this could have been a death sentence for that citizen. And then, on top of all of that, you still have the consistent and constant scapegoating of uh, our Asian-American uh, brothers and sisters. And then, notwithstanding the oppressive policing of COVID distancing uh, in cities all over America. So the bottom line is this virus has really laid bare the latent racism and inequity in America. So I don't presume we're going to solve the many layers of COVID-related racism uh, and institutional white supremacy uh, in a one-hour call, but I think having a dialogue around racism, uh, a typically forbidden subject in America, I think it's constructive, especially uh, in this moment. So uh, let me jump in. So most people of color will acknowledge that uh, ending white supremacy and its systems of oppression is the ultimate goal. However, an important corollary to fighting white supremacy is ending anti-blackness. So white supremacy cannot exist without anti-blackness. So what do I mean by that? So briefly, America is a hierarchical society with white at the top, black at the bottom, and there's some honorary classes in between the marginalized. And so it's a racial class system, if you will. So the goal is to move as far away from blackness to be perceived as a good, quote, American, unquote. So there are a number of ways that this anti-blackness manifests itself. So there are many systems of oppression. So You've seen some of these this week, as I mentioned, uh, you know, unarmed black man murdered by police, uh, white woman exercising white privilege by calling cops on a law abiding black citizen, the lynching of uh, Ahmaud uh, Arbery. But there are a few systems that really aren't so obvious and really sort of operate under the radar of the terror and violence that exists ordinarily. So one of these systems is the so-called model minority myth. So let me talk a little bit about that and sort of simplify it. The model minority myth is a tool of white supremacy and comes in opposition to the civil rights movement. So that whole term was coined in 1966. So it works like this. Anti-blackness is part of the American socialization process in the immigrant experience. So if you want to succeed in this country, you align yourself to those at the top and not the bottom. So any alignment, for example, with Black Lives Matter or demanding equal rights, you know, anything like that is frowned on. But on the other hand, you're expected to be quiet, grateful that you're an American. Now, of course, the model minority myth ignores uh, the fact that Asians aren't monolithic, just like black folks. I mean, there's a ton of variation there. So the concept of acceptance and making it in a white supremacist structure is that it's always temporary, temporary and conditional. And that is seen in a big way with this COVID. COVID bears that out. So Asian Americans of a certain class were most desirable of all of the non-white groups and stereotyped as passive, loyal servants of the American dream. So that's one way that anti-blackness operates to support and buttress uh, white superiority. So the other system of anti-blackness, and this is probably why there are always questions around, well, why is this happening? 
it's the erasure of historical memory. So what I call cognitive dissonance. So what do I mean by that? Now, we can have many, many calls and spend many, many hours on this, but to simplify it, uh, from 1882's Asian Exclusion Act, after Asians were brought into the country uh, to act as cheap labor to build the railroads, to the 1965 Immigration Acts, uh, which by the way, were a result of African Americans fighting for civil rights and making this a truly more democratic uh, country. Asians and African Americans' paths have crossed and indeed intersected. That's the interesting thing, but all of that's erased. Notwithstanding the fact that birthright citizenship as we know it was a Supreme Court case in 1898, uh, and that was uh, a Chinese man, Wong Kim Ark, in San Francisco. So that's why many folks enjoy that. But many Americans are totally unaware of that historical record. And so it leads to collective am amnesia. So to sum it up and to promote what I would call solidarity and in the belief that education and demystifying systems of white supremacy and oppression are crucial, uh, I've compiled resources to fight anti-blackness from diverse sources. So now Inez has some of these resources or so she'll be able to make them available. But uh, briefly, just to go through some of them, uh, there was an amazing uh, PBS documentary this week called the Asian Americans. It is a must see. It really delves deep into American history. Uh, another amazing piece is the 1619 Project. Uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, she won the Pulitzer Prize, talks about the contributions of African Americans to making America a more democratic society. Uh, How to Be an Anti Racist, a book by Ibram Kendi, a MacArthur Jr. Genius Grant winner. And then The Case for Reparations by T. and C. Coates. And then a wonderful young woman, Michelle Kim, has written a blog called 20 Plus uh, Ways to uh, Unite African Americans and Asians. So uh, I think really those things should be looked at to really help us all uh, see the forest for the trees and get along. Thank you, Dee, for that. That was very, um, that was very informational. And yes, we will make all of uh, Dee's uh, references, all the different links and different projects available. We're, I think it's becoming available right now in the chat. And uh, we will also send out an email afterwards with all of these uh, resources in it. So thank you, Dee. And Mel, uh, how are you? All right, well, hard to say, oh. cloudy. You know, apparently, and I use that term because of all, especially events that have been pointed out, obvious to us all, the incredible depression actually over the state of our, uh, the reality we have to work in. On a personal level, just just the uh, the idea of the color of my skin would be impactful. Yes, it's been that way for most of my life, growing up in Texas and other places, but even more so now than ever. And so, yeah. Well, I'll watch my back, you know, and uh, and do the best I can. Uh, but maybe this idea of watching and uh, what COVID exposes is just a, a reality of things that we can't see, you know, uh, the associations of, of the horror that unfolded in Minneapolis and and in in uh, all parts. It's it's been happening for quite a while. Uh, there's something about. COVID that, uh, or Rona that is quite apparent is that a majority of the population being impacted negatively uh, has been the African, uh, African American community. And that is something that I'm deeply um, concerned about because uh, uh, why, you know, and why is it tolerated even? And the, this kind of uh, situation, um, let's point out to what, what am I doing? Well, we've been doing things all along, you know. Uh, uh, even my my the work that we as a group has been uh, focused on and, and led and its impact on society, especially in people of color, 
and, and because this relationship to class and poverty has been very telling. Because most of us, a lot of the uh, situations that are negative uh, for the impact of the virus has been type 2 diabetes, um, it has been um, the, the hypertension, and all these things that they've been isolated, and this incredible racist kind of uh, blaming the victims that has come about. Uh, what I've looked at, is, in other words, I've been looking at the invisible kind of reality that, that what just this, this post-industrial material has impacted adversely community for the last 50 years. So, and, and so what we're looking at are things that the, the insurgency is to expose the things we can't see, you know? There's quite apparent, apparent reality we must resist. Yes, I, I mean, there's, there, there, there should be a mood of revolution. Yeah, burn it all down. Because what we have to burn, though, is, is we have to look at what we're burning. We have to look at the, the conditions that need total uh, disintegration. And uh, so there are the unseen things, and to, uh, to not only kind of point it out through the visual arts or through conceptualism, it is through action. So the actions I feel that, uh, not me, but the collective actions that, I, that are already in place working with her on the issues in Chicago uh, that have been nationwide and led in its discontent, especially within the community of the uh, South Chicago, you know, is one of the most important acts that we can do. As a, as, as a collective kind of reality. We've done that and, you know, we're working, I'm working in the fifth ward. I'm from the fifth ward of Houston. You know, Beyonce's from the third ward. I'm from the fifth ward. And, and when I met her, we made that distinction. Uh, uh, the, the, the important thing, uh, I'm working in the fifth ward. I'm going back to the community I'm from to listen again and to listen to the needs of a community under, under the siege not just because of COVID, but forever it seems. And to, to apply whatever I can as a partner and uh, even preserving, not only um, creating formats or climates for our memories to be encapsulated in a respectful and uh, overt way, but also even projecting beyond that the very key to our survival may be in these neighborhoods. The frontier of the future exists within the most impacted because they have the most education and most creativity on learning how to survive. So it's like inverting my own understanding of what progress is and what conceptual progress is. It's important. So, you know, there are, there are so many uh, important things to do now. It's almost like uh, it's all been about action and, uh, there's a, in me is this idea of looking at even the virus itself. You know, how do you look at it and how do you look at racism? You know, if anything, uh, both are supremely infectious kind of realities have devastating consequences. And I've been looking at the models for a long time of viruses and how they're incomplete, how they're incomplete and they need a host to complete themselves and how to look at uh, the process of a creative process or, or the creative act as itself, as a virion. And in other words, how do we uh, move against or move, infect these, these other uh, presences like supremacy may not be the most overt way. You almost have to create a condition where there is a transformation from within, it needs supremacy is a reaction of, uh, of 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 great cowardice and insecurities, and maybe perhaps what it needs is to complete a cycle of development to move beyond it. And so, how we work uh, as creatives in this is fundamental to the actions that we emerge out from. Uh, uh, not emerge out of it. We're still in the thick of it, and we've been in the thick of it, and there's evidence it's, it's here. This is one more thing. You know, for a while there was the conversation of, of climate change. Well, we're still in that, you know? It's still in that. I remember uh, on a panel, another panel said, okay, 
uh, last year we were talking about racial identity and all this kind of thing. Now we got to do climate change. I said, oh no, we haven't finished the one yet. We haven't finished any of them yet. So it's almost uh, understanding that the work was always there for us to do. And we have to just get back down into it. Now the methodology is what I'm trying to think and conceptualize. Maybe very different. And those methodologies are the lessons we're learning in this panel as well, you know. So what is the, what are the hosts for a, a new insurgency? And, 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 and hold back, you know, hold back a little bit the need to expose yourself. In other words, to, to be an operative within this, it requires a, a masking in itself. I have to use these same terms we're, we're using all the time, you know to mask oneself, to protect yourself or protect your team or whatever uh, that may be necessary to, to go into and complete these very, very vicious incompletions of human nature, you know. Um, so, so we have to look at what's invisible, like that's, that's, that's beyond the obvious. There are things driving these things and, and decisions that are made every day that are, are supporting what we can't see, you see? So um, to have a perspective that is much more open than ever before is fundamental to the way we need to be, be really thinking about things, or I need to be thinking. I don't know, you know, I can't put that all on everybody out there, but I, I definitely have been struggling. And every day you wake up to a greater apprehension and greater struggle, you know? And okay, I'm ready. I think you have to uh, use this opportunity not to hold back, to be much stronger than you have ever been before, and much more of a, uh, of a collaborator than ever before. So, you know, I don't know. Just some quick thoughts. I wasn't even prepared for my eight minutes, but uh, now you got me going. Damn. Well, you'll have a chance later. I'm sure there'll be many questions. Thank you, Mel. All right. So, Teresa. You are our Illinois State representative, and uh, you, but you're also a history teacher. Um, tell us what we can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate all the, the work you put into putting this panel together, and it's an honor to be a part of it, um, even though I'm not technically a member of the creative community. I really appreciate all the the, um, all the work that, that you all do in helping to change society and bring about more equity. Um, so yeah, I started my career as a college professor and I spent many years teaching um, Asian American studies and U.S. history. And uh, so, you know, a lot of what uh, Dee said before um, you know, was, I mean, it's, th those are ideas and, and information that, that, you know, needs to be out there and needs to be a part of our curriculum, but is not, right? I mean, you know, this, this country is built on white supremacy and, um, yet that history is, is largely, um, ignored or hidden, um, you know, brushed aside, swept under the rug, you know, people um, just don't like to talk about it. But, you know, what we are seeing during um, these times, you know, during this pandemic is that the racial inequality that's um, in our society uh, is, is being exposed. Um, you know, we see the racial disparities and the rates of um, infection that are higher and disproportionately um, higher in, in certain communities. We've seen, um, you know, with the uh, Asian American community, how, um, you know, the representation of this virus as a Chinese virus um, has um, heightened the, the attacks, um, the racist attacks on the community. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's distressing, 
right? I mean, you know, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that um, anyone on the panel hasn't already said. Um, it has been a hard week because we've seen, you know, all these fault lines exposed. And um, I think that, you know, what we have to remember um, is that, you know, we're all embedded in this um, system of structural inequality that's, you know, th that's basically got institutional racism at its foundation. And so, you know, what do we do to dismantle it, right? It has to be a deliberate action, anti-racist action that, that, you know, that, um, we, we use to dismantle it and, and not just assume that, well, you know, every new generation is more um, progressive and open-minded and it'll just take care of itself. I mean, that's not gonna change um, the society we live in. I think that, um, you know, we all have to be aware of our, our roles in this um, process of dismantling this, um, this system. And it's really complicated. Um, and it's also really tempting to say, yeah, let's, let's burn it all down. I mean, you know, th there's a lot that um, I would like to see disappear and, and, you know, maybe burning it all down is one approach, but um, there's also the danger of what replaces it, right? So I think we always have to be absolutely conscious of the need to preserve democracy and, you know, people's voices and um, people's ability to play a role in building back up what gets burned down. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're all in this together, um, but, um, you know, sometimes when we talk about racism in this country, there's, you know, this, this danger of, um, you know, different groups competing against one another and, and, you know, thinking in terms of, you know, my oppression is worse than yours. But, I mean, I think we need to think about how uh, these are not separate struggles, right? White, the system of white supremacy and racial hierarchy in this country, you know, as, as you know, Dee so eloquently put it before, I mean, it's, it's all interconnected. Um, and, um, you know, we can't let society pit groups against one another because, you know, that's, that's not going to help us get out of this. That's not going to help us dismantle the system. It's just going to, you know, perpetuate um, the inequality by pitting groups against one another and um, impeding any progress in this um, desire goal that we all have to bring about more equity and to um, have a more just society. Um, so, you know, those are just some of my thoughts. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of commonality, you know, in um, the arena that I work in, right, which is politics, um, but the creative community and the arts, um, you know, it's, it's about it's just as political in a lot of ways, and it's about um, um, expression and you know making commentary on uh, society and trying to uh, use your your vision and your ideas to uh, bring about more awareness to you know uh, force people to um, interrogate the society they live in and, and perhaps um, push for some change. Right. I think it's important for everybody to have a voice. And um, I just happen to have, you know, my voice in a body uh, of 177 people in the Illinois General Assembly. Um, but it's it's also a very diverse group of people. Uh, you know, I work with um, colleagues in the Black Caucus and Latino Caucus and uh, Women's Caucus. And, you know, one of our goals is to um, see, try to figure out the ways in which, you know, we can make a difference, you know, to um, enact laws that are more equitable or, you know, try to change the course of the way things are so that 
um, you know, the ways that things were done before, or the ways in which resources were distributed before, if, you know, it was um, inequitable, you know, what can we do? What kind of policies can we put in place to perhaps change that and, um, you know, make things more equitable, you know, help people who um, are, um, you know, less advantaged um, or to, you know, try to address the, the systemic um, poverty that, that we see all around us. And um, so, um, yeah, that's, I don't know, those are just some thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I'm really grateful to be included in this conversation. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you to uh, all of the panelists and thank you to all the attendees. And I especially wanna thank uh, Liz Sung and Rubita Huang for producing this whole wonderful um, webinar for us. And uh, we're gonna be sharing the poll results and just so everybody knows that Soup Dumplings won. And, um, and feel free, everybody, to reach out to us. We are on Facebook, we have a website, I'm on every social media site you can, you can think of. And um, please reach out and let us know if you have more questions. Let us know how we can do better and if we could do more of these or if you have any art projects that we can help sponsor, um, please reach out. And you will be directed to a survey after this and we really appreciate it. You can fill out the survey for us. It would help us improve our programming. And um, I think that is it for today. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful day. Thank you. It's good to see y'all. You too, bye-bye. Thank you everyone, thank you. Take care now. See you in Miami, DJ. Yes, can't wait soon. Big love, little Haiti. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Bye, Mel. See you.